Archaeologists have found a hill in Turkey that looks like the wreck of Noah's Ark. Durpinar is a hill that at first glance seems to resemble a giant boat. Some scientists believe it to be fossilized remains of a ship. Its shape and size appear to match those of legendary Noah's Ark featured in the Bible. Soil sampling has revealed that humans first settled this place around 5,000 years ago, right about the time the biblical deluge or mega flood is believed to have happened. Now, what other proof could you possibly need? I've just summed up for you what the world's media, including the likes of New York Post, The Sun and Daily Mail, were screaming about at the time of said discovery. The discovery caused a heated discussion at the 7th International Symposium on Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark. But you know what? I first read about this fossilized ark many, many years ago, and already then the fossilized ark at Dirupina had been dismissed as a fake. All right, let's begin from the beginning. Noah was a just and honest man of his kin who walked with God. Noah produced three sons. Hang on, let's fast forward a bit. In 1948, a Kurdish shepherd stumbled on a mysterious geological formation on the slope of Mount Tenderek near the village of Uzanjili in eastern Turkey, some 29 kilometers or 18 miles south of legendary Mount Ararat. The strange-looking structure was revealed following earthquakes and heavy rains. In October 1959, a Turkish Air Force captain named Ilhan Pinar identified the same structure in an aerial photograph of the area he took as part of a mapping mission for NATO. It was suggested for the first time that the structure could in fact be the biblical ship. Durpinar, for whom the place was later named, investigated the site accompanied by several experts, but they found no archaeological evidence there. The official report concluded that the formation, quote, was a freak of nature and not man-made, end of quote. But that wasn't the end of it. You couch experts, it's easy for you to make up all your wild theories about the Ark resting on top of Mount Ararat. By the way, right behind me that's Ararat over there. It's hiding mysteries that would rattle any official scientist to the core. Okay, let's cut to the chase. If something looks like a ship, smells like a ship, and the locals say it's a ship, then it is a ship. Or maybe you'll only believe those lying historians. Nearly 20 years later, Ron Wyatt, a biblical relic hunter by vocation and an anesthesiologist by trade, came to survey the site. After having seen a photo in a magazine of the boat-like formation, Wyatt decided to go and see it for himself. He organized several expeditions to Mount Tenderek, bringing along various experts who used up-to-date scientific methods to explore the site. White was positive he'd found the real ark, in which Noah escaped from the deluge. He claimed to have found lots of evidence to back his theory. In 1985, the site was surveyed using ground-penetrating radar and a so-called molecular frequency generator, revealing some iron structures within the hill, including multiple rivets. What? Iron rivets 5,000 years ago, long before the start of the Iron Age. The scanning also revealed symmetrical partitions covered with soil. The structure had a regular boat-like shape. The length of the structure was measured at 164 meters, or 538 feet, or about 300 royal Egyptian cubits, which is close to the size of the ark mentioned in the Bible. The width didn't match, though, but who cares? The team also found the remains of the upper deck, as well as pieces of petrified wood. In the nearby village of Kazan, the team found huge stones with round holes in them. White believed those to have been used as anchors or drogues on the ark. In 1987, a visitor sent center was opened in the area to enable people from all over the world to access the famed relic. Noah's Ark isn't the only discovery allegedly made by Wyatt. He also claimed to have found the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the real Mount Sinai, the cave where the Ark of Covenant was kept, the rock Moses struck with his staff to get water for the Israelites, and the list goes on and on. Don't you believe him? You naysayers. Before long, however, several members of the White Expedition started to openly voice their doubts regarding the discovery. An expedition member, U.S. Merchant Marine Officer and Ark Enthusiast David Fassold, was initially as upbeat about the discovery as White himself, and even wrote a book about it titled The Ark of Noah. But after several expeditions to the site, Fassold became doubtful that the formation was indeed Noah's Ark. 
In 1996, he co-authored a paper titled Bogus Noah's Ark, where he repudiated his belief. The so-called molecular frequency generator, used by Fessel to search for iron objects, was dismissed as a pseudoscientific device, based on a principle similar to dowsing, but utilizing two copper wires instead of twigs. Needless to say, you won't find this gadget in the arsenal of professional archaeologists. Later, Fasold was involved in a lawsuit, which was touted as a second Scopes Monkey trial. In 1997, Australian geology professor Ian Plymer, a well-known anti-creationist, filed a lawsuit against Alan Roberts, a pastor from Sydney, who was also a self-proclaimed Noah's Ark scholar. At the time, Roberts was in the process of raising funds to go on a lecture tour in Turkey, with plans to visit the alleged location of Noah's Ark. Plymer accused Roberts of false and misleading claims about the European Ars site. Back in 1992, Plymer attended Roberts' lectures in Turkey, where he publicly accused him of lying about the authenticity of Noah's Ark, after which he was forced to leave. That incident provoked a long-lasting feud between the two, culminating in said lawsuit. At that point, David Fasold got involved as well. He accused Roberts of intellectual property rights violation, claiming that he'd used Fasold's drawings without permission. The case received worldwide media coverage, including by highly esteemed scientific journals, Science and Nature. In court, former ARC enthusiast Fasold dismissed the European R theory as absolute BS. Plama hoped the court case would attract public attention to the problem of creationism in education. Unfortunately, he ended up losing the case, with Judge Ron Sackville ruling, quote, Courts should not attempt to provide a remedy for every false or misleading statement made in the course of public debate on matters of general interest." End of quote. On the upside, the court did award Fasold 2,500 Australian dollars in damages for copyright infringement, which Fasold described as a slap in the face. Plymer was even less lucky. He was ordered to pay the legal costs amounting to over 500,000 Australian dollars. I didn't find any confirmation that he did pay that sum, though. Plymer would carry on to be a vocal critic on various occasions, earning himself a bad reputation as a global warming denier. A fighter against pseudoscience ended up joining pseudoscientific circles himself. But let's return to Noah's Ark. Another critic of Wyatt's discovery was John Baumgartner, a geophysicist and member of several of Wyatt's European R expeditions. His duties included drilling test holes and conducting radar and magnetometer scanning. The scholar was quick to conclude that what they were dealing with was a natural geological formation. He stated his opinion in an open letter published in 1996. According to Baumgartner, he discovered instead a massive mountain range that stretched along the long axis of said formation and had the same mineral composition as the rocks nearest to the formation. The material touted as fossilized wood was in actual fact basalt. Baumgartner said he'd analyzed many of the samples in his lab, but failed to find any traces of fossilized wood whatsoever. What White believed to be beams and ribs of a ship turned out to be igneous rock. Neither did Baumgartner manage to identify any kind of iron rivets mentioned by White. He even suggested White could have planted the rivets himself. According to Baumgartner, the formation that was erroneously taken for a ship was formed as a result of a landslide, where liquid mud with pieces of rock that was flowing around the thin and narrow ridge made it look like an almond-shaped boat. Another white critic was Lawrence G. Collins, a professor of geology at the California State University at Northridge, who also studied the Durupinar samples. Collins pointed out that out of 12 rock samples, none contained any traces of wood. Chaotic patterns on the rock sections had nothing in common with the structure of fossilized wood, the samples being basalt or andesite. Drilling also failed to turn up any traces of the boat's bottom anywhere within the formation. As for the alleged iron rivets and braces reported by Wyatt, traces of iron were indeed detected inside the object, but those were confirmed to be iron-containing minerals, mostly magnetite, which is a common component of magmatic materials in volcanic formations in eastern Turkey. Metal detectorists helped find traces of iron outside the arc formation too. 
As for the so-called drogue stones with round holes in them, they were found as far as 24 kilometers or 15 miles away from Durupina. They consist of local andesite, which is not found in Mesopotamia, from where the Ark is believed to have traveled. Similar stones can be found in numerous locations, both in Turkey and Armenia, where they are often revered as sacred objects. Many have been recorded in Christian cemeteries. This photo shows similar stones in Karaunja, the place often referred to as the Armenian Stonehenge. There are dozens of such stones scattered around the site there, with very similar round holes in them. A bit too many and a bit too far away to be the Ark's anchors, don't you think? There are several such formations around the area. The one in question accidentally looks a bit more like a boat, but that's it. Pareidolia, or visual illusion, is what causes people to believe it to be an actual ship. The same effect that makes us see the man in the moon. Our colleague, geologist Pavel Salivanov, points out at several ridges that correspond to harder bedrock exposure. The visibly curve on relatively flat surface, and two of the ridges connect at the ends, with one ridge forming the boards of the ship. According to Salivanov, the boat shape is formed by layers of basalt. Actually, not one boat, but a series of them, one inside another. You can find the full report by Pavel Selivanov in the extra materials in the description. So, what was Ron White's motivation for all his claims? Was he trying to pound a square peg into a round hole, so to say? He was so eager to prove that he'd found the most legendary ship in the world. But why am I getting at poor Wyatt? He hasn't been the only one coming forth with wild speculations. Other expeditions also reported seeing what they believed to be Noah's Ark. Arks were reported on top of Mount Ararat, in the Elbors range in Iran, and lots of other places. People have been searching for the lost Ark since antiquity. However, most archaeologists tend to think Noah's Ark never existed. But what is this discovery of biblical proportions recently touted by the media? The original source is a publication by Hariyat, or Freedom, a major Turkish newspaper. According to the article, scientists are worried about the preservation of the Ark that is being slowly destroyed because of constant erosion and landslides. The article goes on to inform its readers that a research group for Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark has collected 30 samples of geological material and local soil, some of which have been identified as Neptunian or Marian and Argelic or clay materials. The team is reported to have used some unnamed methods to date the samples, getting the time span between 5000 and 3500 BC. The research is reported as still ongoing, but human activity has already been confirmed in the region between between 7,000 and 5,000 years ago. That dating seems to match the ostensible dates for the biblical deluge between 5,000 and 6,000 years ago. Indeed, there were human populations in what are present-day Turkey, Armenia and Iran between 5 and 6,000 years ago. However, the earliest inhabitants in those areas are recorded thousands of years earlier, so no surprises here. With that said, there's little evidence of the biblical deluge, if any. And the Durupinar formation turns out to have nothing in common with the Ark. Strangely, the Harriet article cites no reference to scientific publications by that expedition. What methods have been used for dating, and what exactly have they dated with them? The article also quotes Turkish archaeologist Farouk Hayat as saying that dating alone can't confirm the find as a ship, and much more effort will be needed to confirm or refute that theory. He goes on to say that three universities will continue working on that problem. Good luck to our Turkish colleagues. Last but not least, hear this cautionary tale from the 19th century. On March 26, 1883, an avalanche took place at Mount Ararat. On April 1st that same year, Presbyterian minister and journalist from New Zealand named John McCullough Reed penned an article that claimed as a joke that the avalanche had revealed the remains of Noah's Ark. The article mentioned, quote, an enterprising American traveler, end of quote, seeking to purchase the Ark for exhibition in the United States. Unexpectedly, the prank was picked up by newspapers all over the world. On November 24th, Reed wrote another column apologizing for the hoax, expressing amusement that the story had spread so far, handed on by, quote, all the principal metropolitan and provincial journals in Britain and all over America, end of quote. Despite the retraction, the legend continued to be circulated. 
May the force of real science be with us. Dear friends, we hope you enjoyed this video. Please tell us in the comments what scientific news you'd like us to review or what you'd like us to talk about in more detail in the next episodes. This video was made possible only thanks to your donations. We heartily thank all our supporters and to those who may want to help, you can subscribe to our profile on sponsor.ru if you're in Russia or Boosty if you're based outside Russia. By doing this, you're helping the noble cause of scientific enlightenment. I'm Alexander Sokolov. Bye-bye.